Good morning. I wish I could be with you on the island today in person, but my current state of health makes it impossible for me to travel. I'm speaking to you from my home in San Francisco, sitting across the dining room table from my wife, who is managing the lights, microphone, and camera. First of all, I have to say that I'm overwhelmed and humbled by the honor the ACL board has shown me, an honor that should be shared by the colleagues and students that I've been lucky enough to have around me this past decade and a half while I've been engaged in the FrameNet project at the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley. I've been asked to say something about the evolution of the ideas behind some of the work I've been associated with. I'll do this by sharing my changing understanding of what a language is really like, and I'll accompany this by commenting on how the symbolic representations of the facts of language necessarily capture some facts but leave others out. By that I include the language's writing system at one end, and at the other end, the symbolic ways in which linguists represent the grammatical structure of a sentence, or the meaning of a word or of a sentence. And in the process, for the entertainment of the younger members of the audience, I'll be revealing something of the changes in the technologies available for linguistic studies over the past six or seven decades. The three recurring themes, then, are theory, representation, and technology. As I am sure the ACL board knows, I have never been a direct participant in efforts at language engineering, but I have been a witness to a good neighbor of, and an indirect participant in some parts of it, and I am pleased to learn that the resources my colleagues and I have been building over these past years appear to have been found useful. My first exposure to linguistics came while I was still a kid growing up in St. Paul, Minnesota, when a missionary lady who lived in my neighborhood while she was teaching in a nearby college gave me a copy of Eugene Nida's little book, Linguistic Interludes. This book changed my life. The text of this book takes the form of a conversation in a college campus co-op between a clever and wise linguist and a caricatured collection of innocent, unsuspecting students and colleagues, among them a classicist who strongly defended the logical perfection of the classical languages Greek and Latin. This book succeeded in conveying what linguists believe. Relevant linguistic generalizations are based on the spoken language, not the written language. Almost all concepts of correct grammar are inventions with no basis in the history of the language. There may be primitive communities, but there are no primitive languages. The minor protagonists in these conversations contested each of these principles, and the linguist hero, from his vast knowledge of the most exotic of the world's languages, kept showing them how wrong they were. I liked the idea of knowing things about which most people, including college professors, have wrong opinions, and I liked the idea of being able to help them, so I decided to study linguistics. Before long, I was enrolled in a fairly small linguistics program at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. In those days, there were no linguistics textbooks in the modern sense, so we studied books called Language by Leonard Bloomfield and Edward Sapir, and I took two years of Arabic. I supplemented my training in linguistic methods through summer linguistic institutes put on by the Linguistic Society of America, one in Michigan and one in Berkeley. One of my professors at Minnesota was building concordances of some of the minor late Latin and vulgar Latin texts, and he permitted the students in his class to work with him on these projects. For the advanced students, this was a chance to get valuable hands-on research experience. To the lesser students, it was an opportunity to get extra credit. This was, in a sense, my first exposure to corpus-based linguistics. In this work, for any given document, the first generation of students copied word tokens onto separate file cards, together with each word's parse in the classical sense, and its location in the document. Generation two, the students in the next year's class, 
alphabetized these cards and typed up the concordances. Generation 3, in which I participated, took these same cards and reverse alphabetized them so they could be used for research on suffixes. Alphabetizing words from right to left is stressful at first, but you get used to it. You can imagine my surprise when 30-some years later I came upon Unix commands like sort, sort minus r, and grep, to say nothing of the marvels I experienced later still with keyword in context extraction, lemmatizers, morphological parsers, part of speech tagging, sorting by right and left context, and the full toolkit of corpus processing tools that exist today. In those days, it took a lot of patience to build a concordance, but it also took a lot of patience to use a concordance. A printed concordance to the Shakespeare corpus was a vast index in which for each word you could find all of the lines that it occurred in, and you could find out where that line appeared. You would then go to the source, look it up, and see it in its context. So that, for example, if when studying the phrasal verb take upon, I want to find the full context of this way will I take upon me to wash your liver, I only need to look for my copy of As You Like It, go to Act 3, Scene 2, and look for it there. Compare that to the fully searchable Shakespeare app you can have on your iPad today. Shortly after I graduated from the university, I ended up in Japan, my travel and living expenses paid for by the United States Army. My obligations in the Army were mainly to listen on shortwave radio to Soviet Air Force men recite numbers and to write the numbers down that I heard. The broadcasts included weather reports but were mainly lists of numbers. It was, of course, coded messages. If I had been permitted to say what I was doing, I would have said I was in cryptanalysis. But of course, actually, I was only copying down the numbers I heard. Somebody smart thousands of miles away was figuring out what they meant. The limited demands on my time and intellect allowed me to wander around in Kyoto in my spare time with notebooks and dictionaries to try to learn something about Japanese. The linguistic methods I had learned back home start that morphology, the structure of words. I hadn't had any training in ways of representing the structure of a sentence, but I worked out a do-it-yourself style of sentence diagrams for both Japanese and English, and I was fascinated when I found the occasional sentence in Japanese, which could be translated into English word by word by going from the end to the beginning. When it was time to be discharged from the army, I believed wrongly that I was close to mastering the language and I wanted to stay another year or two. I managed to get a local discharge. As a civilian in Japan, I supported myself by teaching English. With two other visiting Americans, I was permitted to work at Kyoto University with the endlessly kind and patient Professor Endo Yoshimoto. Professor Endo was the author of the main school grammar of Japanese, and with him, my fellow students and I stumbled through old texts and became acquainted with the categories and terminology of the Japanese grammatical tradition. Studying Japanese brought me to one issue in representation, and this has to do with the kana syllabary. One of the themes in this talk is the reality that it's not possible to represent in a writing system, in a parse, or in a grammar, every aspect of a language. So for a given representation system, it's important to know what is on display and what is missing. Studying Japanese brought me to one issue in representation, and this has to do with the kana syllabary. The pronunciation of Japanese words is represented by the symbols of a syllabary, but the components of complex words in this language, in particular the inflected verbs, are not segmented at syllable boundaries. Some verbs have consonant final stems followed by vowel initial suffixes, but this fact is not apparent in the written language. In this slide, the colored symbols represent syllables that contain morpheme boundaries. The top two are the plain and polite ways to say moves. 
The third is does not move, and the bottom example is can move. The second symbol that you see in each of those lines conceals the end of the verb stem and the beginning of the suffix. The written form of a language should not prevent you from discovering its boundaries. While living in Japan, I had been keeping track of linguistics goings on back home, and I had heard that one of the best graduate programs for linguistics was at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So when I finally came back to the States, that's where I went. There was a movement in linguistics in those days toward making linguistics more scientific by designing so-called discovery procedures for linguistic analysis. And I wanted to participate in that work. I had noticed that there were alternative phonemic analyses for both English and Japanese that resulted in different actual numbers of consonants and vowels. If there's no consistent way to do phonemic analysis, how can we compare different languages with each other, or even be confident in answering a simple question like, how many vowels does this language have? I resolved to help design the correct discovery procedure for phonemic analysis founded on the distribution of phonetic primes. For that purpose, I studied phonetics in the linguistics department and in the communication science program, practical phonetics for field linguistics, acoustics phonetics, and physiological phonetics in the laboratory. The basic textbooks in beginning linguistics classes at Michigan were typically presented as step-by-step -step procedures for going from data to units, so this movement was well supported there in Michigan. Kenneth Pike's phonemics textbook even had the subtitle A Technique for Reducing Language to Writing. During those years, I worked part-time on a Russian-English machine translation project with Andreas Kutsudas. I met a number of MT researchers, and I participated in a memorable interview with Yehoshua bar Hillel. Some of you will remember the outcome of the nationwide tour that included this visit. Eventually, it became necessary to take on syntax. Sentences were spoken of as having a horizontal and a vertical dimension. In its horizontal aspect, a sentence could be seen as a sequence of positions. In its vertical aspect, each position could be associated with a set of potential occupants of that position. The scene in the linguistics area in Michigan at mid-century had Charles Fries in the English department constructing a grammar of English that was liberated from traditional notions of nouns, verbs, and adjectives, counting on distributional facts to discover the relevant word classes. In linguistics, Kenneth Pike was elaborating an extremely ambitious view of language in which, at every level of structure, one could speak of linear sequences of positions, labeled roles, naming the functions served by the occupants of these positions, and defined sets of such occupants. Slots, roles, and fillers. It was all very procedural. And in the midst of all this, something big happened, and suddenly everything changed. I was among the first in Ann Arbor to read syntactic structures, and I became an instant convert, and I gave up all ideas of procedural linguistics. The new view was something like this. The grammar of sentences is more than a set of linear structures separately learned. Sentences are generated by hierarchically organized phrase-defining rules. Regularities in the grammar are evidence for rules in the minds of the speakers. The existence of a variety of sentence types is accounted for in terms of the application of rules that move things within, add them to, or delete them from initial representations. Linguistics is theory construction. There is no procedural way to learn how language is structured. The Chomskyan view flourished Universities that didn't have linguistics programs wanted one, and after I finished my degree, I ended up joining William S. Y. Wong in the brand new program at The Ohio State University. 
The view represented in Chomsky's 1965 Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, with its sharp separation of deep structure and surface structure, became the mainstream, and I worked within it faithfully, participating eagerly in efforts to combine all the rules into a single coherent grammar of English, an effort heavily supported, for some reason, by the United States Air Force. During this period, I felt I knew what to do, and I believed that I understood everything that everybody else in the framework was doing. That feeling didn't last very long. At one point, I did a seminar with a, in which a small group of students and I worked our way through Lucien Teniers Elements, without necessarily understanding everything in it and I became aware of a different way of organizing and representing linguistic facts. You can never represent everything about a sentence in a single diagram, and this first exposure to what later evolved as dependency grammar made me aware of the impossibility of displaying simultaneously the functional relations between the words in a sentence, the left-to-right sequence of words in the sentence as spoken, and the grouping of words into phonologically integrated phrases. As an extreme example of the kinds of information a tenure style dependency tree could contain, I offer you his analysis of a complex sentence from the Latin of Cicero. Many of you will remember this from your high school Latin studies. The sentence in Latin is est enim in manibus laudatio quam cum legimus quem philosophum non contemnimus. It has a relative pronoun, quam, which is extracted from a subordinate temporal clause, cum legimus, when we read, which is paired with a rhetorical question inside the relative clause. It has roughly the same structure as, here's a sentence while reading which who wouldn't get confused. Tenier produced a diagram showing the multiple connections of the pronoun quam with dashed lines breaking it into two pieces, qu and am, showing that it is the marker of the relative clause, agrees in gender and number with the head noun laudatio, and has the accusative and is the accusative object of legimus. This is the diagram, but I'll point out only the connections assigned to one word in it, the relative pronoun quam. This won't take long. Instead of having lines pointing to a single token of the word, Tenier breaks the word up into two pieces connected by the broken line at the bottom. The word agrees with laudatio in gender and number, and that connection is indicated by the upper broken line. It is the marker of the relative clause headed by contemnimus, as shown in the horizontal structure it is hanging from and it is the direct object of legimus, bottom right. This diagram shows more than simple dependency relations, using various ingenious tricks and decorations to smuggle in other kinds of facts. The word-to-word -word connections are shown to be sure, but it's really clear that a system for projecting from such a diagram to a linear string of words spread into phonologically separable phrases has to be incredibly complex. Tenier also described a number of conjoined structures in French for which he used the terminology of embryological mistakes, one kind being monsters that have one head and more than one tail, verb gapping in our terms, John likes apples and Mary oranges, another kind having more than one head and a single tail, that corresponds to right node raising. John likes and Mary detests anchovies. And the most monstrous of all, capital H-shaped monsters with two heads and two tails, like the kinds of sentences Paul Kay and Mary Catherine O'Connor and I played with in a paper on let alone. I wouldn't touch let alone eat shrimp, let alone squid. The phenomena have more to do with sequencing patterns than with dependency relations. But it's interesting that Tenier delighted in exploring these kinds of structural complexity. I ended up favoring phrase structure representations, partly because while dependency representations have no easy way to identify a predicate or verb phrase constituent, I'd like to believe that the verb phrase can in general be treated as naming 
a natural category like eating meat or parking a car or being breakable, etc. But mainly because phrase structural representations offer more material upon which to assign intonational contours. This may be the place to make a linguist's confession. I've been claiming that certain forms of representation are too complex and therefore should be replaced by something else. My confession is that through all the years of hanging around with computational linguists and computer scientists in general, it took a long time for it to sink in that to a computer a useful representation doesn't have to have the kind of structure whose organization can be made obvious to human perception. But eventually linguistics has to deal with meaning. When linguists turn to the predicate calculus as a representation for sentence meaning, many were interested mainly in quantification and negation, where it's possible to show how complex logical structures can be formulated in ways that ignore the actual meanings of the words that named either the predicates or the arguments. I, however, was specifically interested in the inner structure of the predicates themselves. It was common to employ the prefix notation, allowing the ordered list of symbols following the name of the predicate to stand for the number of arguments of the particular predicate, so that P of A could represent an adjective like hungry or a verb like vanish. P of A, B, relating two things to each other, could stand for an adjective like different or a verb like love. And P of A, B, C with three arguments could stand for an adjective like intermediate or a verb like give, show, or tell. Not to mention cases in which the arguments could themselves be predications permitting recursion. There are centuries old traditions by which school teachers explain that the subject names the agent in an event and the object tells us what is affected, but it's trivial to find examples that show that such generalizations do not hold. Similarly, in the predicate argument formula, there is nothing meaningful about being the first or second or third item in a list. In the examples with blame on the slide, the second and third arguments are interchanged in their grammatical realization. With the pair strike and regard, the first and the second are interchanged. And with buy and sell, the first and the third are interchanged. I felt that there ought to be some way of recognizing the sameness of the semantic functions of these arguments independently of where they happen to be sitting in an ordered list. An alternative was spelled out in a rambling paper called The Case for Case, published in 1968. It proposed a universal list of semantic role types called cases configurations of which could characterize the structure of verb and adjective meanings. In this way, predicate naming lexical items could be shown as differing according to the collection of cases they required, obligatory, or welcomed, optional. In this view, semantic relations or deep cases, like agent and so on, uh, are directly linked to argument meanings. So in a certain sentence, John is the agent, Mary is the recipient, and a rose is the transmitted object. John gave Mary a rose. Grammatical roles, subject and object, and markings like choice of prepositions are predicted from case configurations. So the agent could be the subject, the object could be the grammatical object, and the recipient could be introduced with the preposition too. Generalizations in this system are formulated in terms of specific named cases for which a hierarchy is defined. The list of cases is universal and finite. The variable valences, valence is a term from Tenier, of a verb can be explained in terms of the cases available to it. The starting examples used in this discussion were the, with the verb open. Agent, instrument, object is a hierarchy illustrated with open with the following examples. If there is only the object, it becomes the subject, so we say the door opened. If there is an agent in addition to an object, then the agent becomes the subject, I opened the door. If there is an instrument and no agent, 
then the instrument outranks the object, so it becomes the subject. The key opens the door. But there is an, if there is an agent and an instrument and an object, the agent becomes the subject, the object becomes the grammatical object, and the instrument is indicated with the preposition with. I open the door with the key. The occupants of nuclear slots, subject and object, are determined by the hierarchy. The rest are marked by prepositions, as long as we're only talking about NP arguments. There was a time when case grammar, so-called, was very popular, and partly because of that, I eventually ended up in Berkeley, California, and soon participated in the vibrant cognitive science program there. I continued to work on case grammar and transformational grammar, disappointed that the former was not accepted as a contribution to the latter. Gradually, case grammar evolved into frame semantics. Given lists of cases, it became possible to define situation types as assemblies of these. Such assemblies are referred to as case frames. With a large number of case names or semantic role names, it should be possible to define a very large number of situation types. Agent, instrument, object. Uh, I fixed it with the screwdriver, where the it is the object and with the screwdriver is the instrument. Object, path, goal. The water flowed through the crack in the floor into the storage room. Experiencer, content. I remembered the accident. Stimulus, experiencer. The noise scared me. Stimulus, experiencer, content. The noise reminded me of the accident. Various proposals by John Sowa, among others, existed that greatly increased the number of cases, enabling descriptions of more kinds of situations and events. Researchers working with semantic roles tend to think of them as identifying the roles of participants in the event, in the case of verbs that describe events. Some problematic cases emerged. One of the first to hit me involved some uses of the verb replace. Consider the sentence, Today I finally replaced that bicycle that got stolen a year ago. The bicycle that got stolen a year ago was not a participant in the replacement event that happened today. It wasn't around. The bicycle can be mentioned in the sentence, given the grammatical requirements of the verb replace, because the bicycle was a participant in the narrative that defines a replacement event. Instead of defining frames in terms of assemblies of roles, what about making frames the primitive notions and defining roles in terms of the frames? I then started thinking that the job of lexical semantics is to characterize frames on their own and work out the participant structures frame by frame. At some point, I got invited to give some lectures at Roger Schenck's Artificial Intelligence Lab in Yale, where I witnessed work on information retrieval in the form of a system that collected information from newspaper accounts of traffic accidents. My impression was that the system was given texts that were known to be about traffic accidents, and it was already provided with a checklist of information to look for, based ultimately on the style sheets used by reporters working on traffic accident assignments, or really ultimately on the reporting traditions of the local police department. Names, ages, and addresses of drivers, passengers, and victims, make, model, and year of the vehicle, location of the accident, direction of moving vehicles, presence of injuries or fatalities, reports from police authorities, etc. The system needed to recognize capital letters, punctuation, numbers, and a set of specific words like driver, passenger, victim, ambulance, street, avenue, highway, boulevard, sheriff, officer, vehicle, and so on. So that when it came upon something like this, it would know what to do. Walter O. Magnuson, comma, 23, comma, of 79 West Walnut Street, comma, Heartland. That's a common pattern for name, age, and address of a participant. Was westbound on 28th Street near Blossom Road. That's a familiar pattern for direction and location. In a 1998 Chevrolet pickup. 
That's a patterned way of talking about the vehicle. When he and passenger Wilma J. Alter, comma, 27, comma, same address, argued, we've identified another participant. It goes on, according to Sheriff Deputy Carl Vogelin, the officer is identified as Sheriff Deputy Carl Vogelin. We don't need to know how old he is, uh, and so on. Uh, we, we see in the rest of the sentence the term uh, community hospital, uh, possible injuries, and the pickup was registered to a certain person. So I wondered if a kind of general purpose extraction process could be designed by which the system didn't know in advance what the text was about, but in which particular words in the text would evoke their own checklist of things to look for. List, a list of things to look for that come f with the entry for the word. Maybe the heading of a newspaper article might be fatal accident on Highway 17 or the like, and that word accident would get things started. The presence in a text of a word like revenge, for example, could start the search for the identity of the offender, the name of the injured party, the avenger, the punishment inflicted or intended, and so on, a checklist that would be evoked by a dozen other words in the same frame. That is, a word could evoke a frame, and the semantic parser's job is to find the elements of that frame in the text, sometimes in the same sentence in positions determined by the grammar of the word, but sometimes in neighboring sentences. The idea behind frame semantics is that speakers are aware of possibly quite complex situation types, packages of connected expectations that go by various names, frames, schemas, scenarios, scripts, cultural narratives, memes, and the words in the language are understood with such frames as their presupposed background. These are concepts developed with slightly different meanings and for different purposes in artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, and sociology. I use the word frame promiscuously to cover all of them, except that in frame semantics, I'm particularly concerned with those that are clearly linked to elements of linguistic form, words, or constructions. In 1988, at a summer school in Pisa, Italy, run by the late Antonio Zampoli, I met Sue Atkins, the lexicographer. I was teaching a course on frame semantics, and she was teaching a course on corpus-based lexicography that included the examination of concordance lines for the verb risk. Sue and I decided to join forces and come up with a complete frame description of risk based on corpus evidence that would show how the words that belong to this frame work. The title of the first paper that resulted from this research was Toward a Frame-Based Lexicon, the Semantics of Risk and Its Neighbors. We presented the main arguments jointly at the 1991 meeting of ACL in Berkeley. The paper got published in 1992. Um, eventually I retired, and uh, when I retired I was welcomed at the International Computer Science Institute where I worked on writing proposals to get support for the kind of frame-based lexicon I was interested in. This eventually became known as FrameNet. We were supported between 1997 and 2003 from fairly large grants from the National Science Foundation. Since then, we received small grants from NSF and other sources. My colleagues and I keep busy hunting for reliable, long-term funding to stay afloat. The goal of the project was to create a database to be used by humans and computers that would include a list of all of the frames that we could possibly have time to describe, currently about 1,200, for each frame to identify the frame elements, here FEs, which are the things worth talking about when a given frame is relevant. Generally, there are three to eight FEs per frame. The lexical units, here LUs, that are associated with the frame, we say that the lexical unit evokes the frame. The current total number of lexical units across the frames is roughly 13,000. A body of annotations of sentences in which the target word is highlighted 
and the grammatical positions in the sentence where the words, frames, FEs are expressed are identified. We have, we're approaching 200,000 annotated sentences. And lastly, lexical entries which summarize the information derivable from the annotations. Frames are the cognitive schemata that underlie the meanings of the words that evoke them. Here is a partial list taken from the alphabetical list of frames, including compliance, compatibility, competition, complaining, etc., including compliance. Uh, lexical units are tied to the frames that they evoke. Here are the first few and the last few lexical units connected with compliance. Abide, adhere, adherence, breach the noun, breach the verb, and ending with uh, transgress the verb, transgression the noun, violate the verb, violation the noun. Frame elements are roughly the things that are worth talking about when a frame is relevant. Their names are introduced in the frame description and assign colors uh, to separate them from each other. The compliance frame concerns acts and states of affairs for which protagonists are responsible and which either follow or violate some set of rules or norms. Sentences selected from the FrameNet corpus are annotated for individual LUs to show how the FEs or frame elements are syntactically rendered. The subjects in the following sentences represent different compliance FEs. The wiring in this room is in violation of the building code. The wiring in this room then stands for the state of affairs. You have broken the rules. You is the protagonist. My action was in compliance with the school's traditions. My action is the act. Going back over these, we see that the building code, the rules, and the school's traditions are the phrases in these sentences that stand for the norms. Lexical entries summarize the mappings of individual FEs, LU by LU. For example, for the frame element norm in the frame compliance, we find with the verb complies, it complies with X. With breach, we say is in breach of. With violate, the norm is simply the direct object, violates X. With conform, we choose the preposition to, conforms to X. With abide, you choose the preposition by, abides by the norm. With adhere, again, you choose the preposition to, adheres to X. The frames uh, don't occur in simply a flat list, but they, they are organized in a network. And the frames linked in the network are linked by relations of inheritance, part of, presupposes, and so on. This slide gives us a glimpse of uh, the frame network in which compliance is uh, at the center. We see that it's connected with social behavior evaluation and various other things. In recent years, we've added to the FrameNet database something we call the Constructicon, which is a list of grammatical constructions, descriptions of their components, and descriptions of the properties and functions of the phrases or constituents that they license. Some members of the team are participants in the movement called Construction Grammar, supporting a view of grammar as a collection of constructions where each construction constitutes a way of assembling the meanings of the components into a semantic whole, not obviously predictable by familiar principles from the meanings of the parts. The collection includes special constructions like the ones that license the bigger they come, the harder they fall, or rate expressions like 20 miles an hour, or unusual symmetric relation expressions like I am friends with the president, but also major constructions with semantic import, such as conditional sentences, exclamations, a large variety of coordinating constructions, and comparative constructions. The constructions bring frames of their own and the analysis task is to integrate the information from the words with those contributed by the constructions. The Constructicon is linked to a set of sentences annotated according to the properties of the construction being analyzed, 
Professor Hiroaki Sato of Senshu University in Japan has designed a temporary tool for viewing the constructional information. The ultimate goal is to be able to understand everything that can be known about a word or a sentence or a language or a speaker's knowledge of their language. This goal can never be achieved, but one keeps trying piece by piece. In the syntactic end, I am hoping that a, the conceptual tools available in sign-based construction grammar spearheaded by Ivan Sog will enable a great deal of progress in that direction. I recently came upon in my notes a program from the 1988 Pisa Institute that showed that I was on a panel one evening addressing the question, what would a linguist like to find in the dictionary of 2001? I don't remember what I said, but I think that if everything could work the way we planned it, and if the project ever gets the funds to complete the job, the ICSI FrameNet database of 2020 will stand a chance of being close to that ideal dictionary of 2001. I want to thank the ACL board once again for this recognition, and I especially want to thank the conference participants for listening to this. Thank you.